Greetings from CNS. Welcome to this special episode of NTV Dialogues, a special interview series presenting insightful and thought-provoking conversations with leaders to accelerate progress towards ending TB. This series underpins the urgency to step up the fight against the epidemic. <coughs> Excuse me. 193 countries have promised to eliminate TB by 2030. And that leaves us with only 135 months to end the pad pandemic globally. But the Global TB Report 2019 has set the alarm bells ringing already. Business as usual will not do. New and, new and fresh thinking is vital to reimagine TB care and control, as well as to accelerate progress towards other SDGs. This episode of NTV Dialogues features a very special guest today, Dr. Mario Raviglion, whose name needs no introduction in the field of global health. But just to be on record, Mario is currently professor at the University of Milan. He was head of the World, TB, World Health Organization Global TB program for nearly 15 years from 2003 to 2017. His tenure at WHO marked an epic period in the fight against TB. He was very instrumental in developing the DOT strategy as well as the NTP strategy. Welcome, Mario, and thanks for agreeing to speak with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shobha. Mario, the latest global TB report shows that the world is not on track to achieve even the 2020 milestones of the NTB strategy. The cumulative decline rate between 2015 and 2018 has been 6.2% against the target of 20% for 2015-2020. Uh, Almost two years have passed since the first ever global ministerial meet that took place in Moscow, thanks to you, in November 2017, and one year since the first ever UN HLM on TB. Why is the spike in political commitment not translating into progress towards ending TB? Well, that, uh, that is a very uh, crucial question because uh, uh, for many years, for decades, we said that tuberculosis was a, a top priority for every government to address and uh, we were not able to do it at a very high level. Then we had the ministerial conference in Moscow, as you mentioned, as well as the United Nations right, uh, General Assembly with a high-level meeting devoted entirely to tuberculosis, which is an extraordinary achievement. Now, uh, the big hope when we even conceived that sequence of events, Moscow followed by the UN General Assembly back three, four years ago, the hope was really to mobilize the leaders of the countries, mobilize the major stakeholders in the world, that is, those who have money to invest, whether it is for programmatic issues or for research. And the big hope there was indeed that of uh, uh, creating a momentum that would have taken tuberculosis at a higher level. Now, what can we say from, uh, from uh, uh, this perspective? Well, uh, uh, number one, uh, definitely uh, tuberculosis is much more in the political agenda now than it was 10 or 15 years ago. That is no doubt. Uh, tuberculosis is now part of the uh, discussion when there is some discussion going on, on whether it is antimicrobial resistance, a top priority in the world, or whether it is the sustainable development goals and so on. So at the political level, yes, it is much more visible. At the same time, the issue really is what you are hinting to. How come that we did not have, uh, um, I'm going to say, sufficient uh, um, uh, funding mobilization, sufficient financing, sufficient commitments by governments and by other stakeholders to really uh, give it a push and accelerate, go a step, you know, a step forward. Um, this uh, didn't seem in reality to happen after the UN General Assembly. I have seen a mobilization of some additional resources, but fairly small compared to the needs. The new report shows that there is still a, a, an over $3 billion uh, that are needed if one really wants to do things right. And uh, more concerningly, even in a way, 
is the big lack of money invested in research. I never agreed with the uh, Stop TV plan of $2 billion because I see what, what has happened in the AIDS uh, community, in HIV community, where the investments have been like 10, 20 times higher than that, even today. And, and so, therefore, no surprise that there are 35 or 37 new antiretrovirals developed in, uh, in, uh, in 20, 30 years of, of, of research. In TB, we had two or three drugs developed in half a century. So, I mean, the difference is obvious. And I think that the research component, uh, 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 the investment in research, have been going so slowly, they are increasing. They are increasing by 20, 30 million dollars per year, but that is far from sufficient to achieve uh, uh, or to try to get those new tools that we were envisaging when we uh, established the NTB strategy targets. We were saying by 2025, we need to have a point of care easy test. We need to have shorter regimens. We need to have this, we need to have that. We need to have a vaccine in the end. But I, I, I see that the, the, the struggle there has to continue. And, uh, and therefore, the, to answer your question now directly, uh, the amount of commitment seen uh, by governments or by other stakeholders uh, has been relatively small compared to the uh, level, uh, in a way, of visibility that tuberculosis has reached in uh, the past uh, two or three years. And uh, the, the reason for that is probably the chronic uh, neglect of a disease like this one that, as we know, kills 4,500 people every day, and there is no one that is saying this is a scandal, we really have to stop it. There are many good uh, uh, meetings ending with nice resolutions, but in the end, when it comes down to financing TB control or financing TB research, well, we struggle. It's not sufficient. Okay. Uh, Mario, another major cog in the NTB wheel is latent tuberculosis. That is what many of us feel with 1.7 billion people infected with latent TB. Uh, what is your take on the UNHLM political declaration target of uh, uh, putting 30 million people on latent t uh, preventive TB therapy by 2022? Uh, are we aiming way too low on eliminating latent TB infection? The aspiration is to eliminate TB by 2030. So shouldn't it be a higher... Goal? Well, latent TB infection is um, um, one of the major reasons for this epidemic to continue the way it is. We have a pool of, here we have to be careful, potentially infected 1.7 billion people. We really do not know what the number is because the tests we have available today are, uh, um, uh, how can I say, an imperfect test, whether it is the tuberculin skin test or the IGRA test, well, we, we are simply seeing who has been exposed to tuberculosis sometime in the past. So if I am positive, someone will tell me, well, you have been exposed. And I will say, when? I do not know. And I will then ask, but am I still infected? Do I have the bacilli of tuberculosis in my body? And the answer would be, I do not know. I only know that you have been exposed. This is memory of our immune system telling us you have been exposed. So that is an important point because it tells you immediately that these ideas that sometimes I hear of, you know, treating for latent infection 1.7 billion people will mean, you know, accepting side effects because these are not uh, uh, treatments that can be taken lightly. It's not giving a pill of Tylenol to someone who has back pain. This is a more complicated story, even with the shorter regimens, you know, there is toxicity there. And so we have to think about that and we have to think the ethical, we have to have ethical considerations about do I need to really screen everyone? Do I really need to treat everyone? That is why uh, in the end, when you look at scientific guidelines made by people that understand really this situation, the uh, groups at risk, those for, for whom uh, uh, the uh, prophylaxis with, uh, with uh, whether it is the old the Iron Age, or it is the new regimen that lasts only three months, et cetera, et cetera, with one weekly dose of rifapentin Iron Age. You know, uh, those risk groups are limited to three or four that are those where the risk of producing um, side effects is, in a way, uh, overcome by the high, very high risk of developing tuberculosis if they're really infected. 
which we don't know once again with the test, right? We only know that they've been exposed. So uh, um, those, risk, uh, group, those risk groups are in fact uh, uh, in the people living with HIV, are in the new contacts, those who have been in contact with a case of tuberculosis in the past, say, 12 to 18 months, because we know that that is the period during which the chance of developing TB is very high. Then after that, it, it goes down. Or those people who are taking drugs such as steroids, such as TNF alpha uh, inhibitors, uh, people with CD causes, perhaps, and so on. There are a few people on dialysis. So there are uh, well defined groups at risk where the prophylaxis should be systematically implemented. However, this is not 1.7 billion. So we have to be very careful about this thing. Um, are we on track on that? Well, it, it seems that uh, in the latest report, I've seen. Uh, over uh, basically uh, nearly, essentially, 2 million people uh, with HIV being treated, which uh, means last year, which means a doubling from the previous year. And it's full, this one, on track to uh, get to this, I believe, 6 million out of the 30 targets, six of them are among people with HIV. So that is reachable because people with HIV go to clinics. They are in the system. They have to have the prescriptions, right, and so on while uh, much less is the progress as, in fact, minimum progress, if not uh, even regression, like in the case of adult contacts, in, according to the latest report, where a number which is in the 70,000 or so have been treated out of millions. And children, the same, the same thing. There is uh, uh, literally uh, only a quarter or a third of whatever children that have, are supposed to be treated, that are candidates, and are, are, are simply not treated. So the real work has to be done if that target has to be reached in the close contact, which, in, which requires, in a way, a full understanding by the physician or the nurse that are seeing patients with TB, that the contacts have to be called to the clinic, they have to be provided the test and provided them with the prophylaxis, because that is the time when they will develop TB, the next several months. So this is where I see that there is no progress, and that requires uh, uh, not just drugs, it requires education of the physician, education of the nurses, and really, in a way, campaigns, and focusing on those risk groups that are the ones at very high risk, where, you know, prophylaxis is absolutely a must. Uh, all the more reason, I think, what you're saying is very right, uh, Mario, mm -hmm. that uh, for these high-risk groups, say, the contacts of uh, uh, TB patients, uh, shouldn't there be test and treat policy. Because as you're saying, I may be uh, at risk of it, I may be harboring the latent TB uh, bacteria. And somebody tells me you take prophylaxis because you are a high risk group. I would not like to go for that when I'm not even sure whether uh, I have latent TB or not. So do you think it should be a test and treat policy? Just help us understand the best scientific way to deal with this latent TB pool and to empty it. Should well, I, yes. Yeah. yeah, the test and treat is in a way is a slogan because uh, uh, um, uh, in, in, in most places, people, what people do is in fact testing for latent infection and then deciding if to treat or not to treat. N nevertheless, you have to keep in mind that, uh, and that is one of the reasons, for instance, why in the guidelines of WHO you don't find or rather, you find the, um, the option of testing or even not testing and saying in these high-risk groups, you need no test, just go ahead, right? So um, this, is, this is also to accommodate the, uh, let's say, the requirement, the needs of the uh, poorest uh, places where probably testing is not available, etc. So the question would be, I am living in a uh, very poor area. I don't have the availability of tuberculin. Let us remember that has become rare tuberculin nowadays, or I don't have the money to spend on, uh, on an EGRA, and I don't have the laboratory, what do I do? And the answer is you treat, okay? Because this is the most fundamental thing. So, I mean, no one in a way is saying not to test. Uh, if you can test, do it. But if you cannot test, just those risk groups is where the focus should be. And regardless of the result of the test, you should treat. Let us remember the test is once again not a uh, real indication of infection, it's a proxy. We think that if you're positive, right, you still harbor the bacilli, but I'm not sure. You could have actually worn the bacilli, you know, 10 years ago, 
by, by your own immune system and now you're still positive because there is memory for that. So that's why this insistence on the testing is, uh, you know, yeah, if you, can, if you want to do it, do it. But if you cannot do it for whatever reason or you don't have time, or et cetera, et cetera, just go ahead and treat those high risk groups. So that's why this, uh, this, this, uh, this test and treat is imported in a way from other conditions, from other diseases. And uh, I mean, to me, it's just a little slogan. Okay. So we need better diagnostic tests also for latent TB. Is that That's right? the answer. The answer is exactly that one. So if I had a test that absolutely tells me this person is not just positive because he has been or she has been exposed, but uh, is the positivity means that there is a bacillus going on living in the body, there will be no more question. Then it's another issue because then you know that this person is harboring the bacilli and is therefore at risk, especially when some other uh, uh, risk factors comes in. Person who is HIV positive, person who is malnourished, person with diabetes, person who is smoking, person who <clears throat> is uh, uh, abusing alcohol or drugs and so on. So we know <clears throat> that these are the risk groups and uh, a test that will tell me that they still harbor the bacilli, number one, and two, that they are now in a phase of progressive slow development of tuberculosis, I, that would be wonderful. If I had a test like this, then it would be worthwhile to screen potentially the entire human population if I had the possibility to do it. Because then I really know who is going to develop TB and who is not going to develop TB because of a previous exposure that has been, in a way, um, worn by the immune system. So uh, I think that this is, uh, this is definitely a, a top priority for research. And I go even further, what we should have really is a point of care test for latent infection. Because if I go around the villages where I know there is a lot of tuberculosis and I test everyone with a, let's say a saliva test, like in the case of HIV, wonderful. Then I have a good chance of winning my war against tuberculosis. Because then I will really pick up those who are developing TB or will be developing TB in the next few years, and therefore I can, in a way, prophylax them, and TB will never develop. Right, right. Uh, Mario, you were very instrumental in organizing, uh, in 2017, the first WHO Global Ministerial Conference uh, through a multi-sectoral response. Uh, in the case of latent TB, I think the role of non-health sectors becomes even more important because we are aiming to reach out to a seemingly healthy population to empty the pool, people who perceive themselves as healthy. So are non-health sectors prioritizing TB and latent TB and integrating TB and latent TB in their agenda? Or what is your take on that? Well, you know, once again, we go back to the issue of the risk groups and the Groups are those uh, that I have indicated already, right? Whether it is HIV or it is uh, a recent contact or some other risk groups uh, uh, like people on dialysis, people taking certain uh, medications and so on. So uh, focusing on those risk groups requires a, a participation of perhaps in some cases um, more than sectors, I would say, uh, branches of the uh, health sector that are not necessarily normally involved in activities of prevention of tuberculosis. Um, if you focus for a moment on these various risk groups, then you find that most of them are medical. So you will still be in the health sector. It's a matter of telling all people seeing patients with uh, patient people living with HIV and telling them anytime you have to offer prophylaxis. So that's one thing. Contact is still in the health sector. When you see a case of TB, these are TB, these are TB programs. So they are responsible to say, okay, get me your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter, so that I can start prophylaxis. Uh, people do, who are on dialysis are in the hospital to get dialysis. People who have diabetes see the, see the doctors because they have to be also uh, receiving prescriptions. So all of them are captured uh, um, in the health sectors in the health sector. So it's, uh, in a way, populations that we can, in a way, target fairly easily. It's a matter of, once again, educating the uh, other, you know, people who take care of diabetes, people in primary care, and so on and so forth. More difficulties for other risk groups, uh, say smokers, for example. There is no demonstration that we should uh, uh, treat smokers 
with prophylaxis. But we know that the risk of developing tuberculosis is three times, two and a half to three times higher among people who smoke compared to people who do not smoke. So people who smoke not necessarily are sick, right? The vast majority is not sick. So how do I, if I can use this word once again, capture this population? How can I get to the point where I can see them systematically and remind them if you are coughing too much, if it's something new, if you have fever, you need to, uh, for instance, go for active case detection. Or before that, you need prophylaxis. That is the difficulty in, in how you, and uh, which sector actually can you involve to uh, really get to the people who smoke, for example, or the people who are malnourished if uh, they live in rural areas of India or Africa and so on. It's difficult. So, yes, it is true that the involvement of other sectors may be uh, very important. Uh, I think, though, when we think about the multi-sectoral approach and the, let's call it multidisciplinary, different disciplines uh, applying to uh, approach, then I'm thinking much more about the conditions that determine the exposure to tuberculosis and therefore the passage then from latent infection for those exposed to disease. So uh, I'm thinking about, for example, the educational sector, uh, sector. What can they do to inform people they are coughing too much that is TB? Or if, uh, you know, uh, people that are in, in, in the exam, uh, for example, in the uh, urban uh, um, health type of situation, health in, in general, I'm not talking health as yes. human health, mm -hmm. but, you know, good metropolitan areas. So that is where the living conditions come to, 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 to the table. That is where the nutrition status come to the table. So I, I look at the nutrition sector to, to guarantee if I were a, 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 a head of a government and I really wanted to fight tuberculosis as, many, uh, as well as many other diseases, I would have to have campaigns for better nutrition, for better urban conditions, for better living condition, for less uh, uh, indoor air pollution. 70% of the human population, especially women that stay at home to cook, oftentimes use fuels that are toxic. This toxicity of the fuels, in the end, impairs the lung capacity to uh, protect us against bacilli like tuberculosis. So imagine if I had a good campaign saying we need clean energy. That will also favor the elimination of tuberculosis. So that's where the multisectoriality and multidisciplinarity counts even more because that is really the way one day we can eliminate TB. You have full development, you have good education, you have good nutrition, you have good living condition, then tuberculosis will go down as it happened in rich countries over the past one century. Okay, so basically these are also what you have listed just now. These are the methods uh, to ensure that uh, no new uninfected individual contracts latent TB from an infected person if we take care of... Yeah. Okay. That is absolutely correct. So it's really the primary prevention of tuberculosis that requires the comprehensive full development of a society. Uh, Mario, is there a drug resistant strain of latent TB also? We would like our listeners to know about that. Of course. Of course. Of course. Okay. So it means that if you have if you have a patient with multidrug resistant tuberculosis and the patient lives at home in a closed environment and breathes there, and the poor wife or the poor husband is exposed, and the poor children are exposed, once they get infected, and they, at that point, have latent infection, they will harbor, unless the system is capable of rejecting them, they would harbor bacilli which are resistant. These are mutants. So it's like being you know, with the blonde hair or with the black hair. So if you get the one with the blonde hair, you have the one with the blonde hair. And if you get the one with the black hair, you have the one. So that is what it is. So the bacilli inside your body, after having been exposed to a multidrug resistant TB case, will be multidrug resistant. So if one day this person becomes HIV positive, or is malnourished, or has diabetes, or smokes, or whatever the risk factors are, then once the person develops tuberculosis, that tuberculosis from the start, will be a multidrug resistant tuberculosis. Okay. Uh, so is the diagnosis and treatment of drug resistant latent tuberculosis the same as that for uh, the normal one? 
or is there, there, there are no real uh, there are studies going on, on that uh, we don't have at this point a definitive answer uh, what people do when uh, for instance let's say that you have a person there that comes and is a contact because you have called the family, you have a multi-drug resistant TB case, you call the family, you test the family, you say you are latently infected now by your husband, your wife, or your uncle who is a patient with multi-drug resistant TB. Then in that case, what most people would do is either two things, observe, do nothing, saying, well, I don't know what to use for you because this person is now resistant to everything. And if you are infected, infected with something that is resistant to everything or almost everything so they observe and they say okay you have to come back here and tell me every two three months you know if you are okay if you are losing weight because then in that case i will have to jump on the case do early diagnosis and treat right for multi-drug resistant TB. there are others who use uh, fluoroquinolones some others have used especially fluoroquinolones i would say some others are using a combination of fluoroquinolones and etionamide so different types, uh, I'm pretty sure that there are people testing now bedaquiline or Delamanid or one of these drugs. So, um, but as again, is no, uh, at this moment, uh, there is no uh, scientifically uh, um, proven uh, evidence. There is no trial yet that has shown that this is uh, something effective. It's not easy if you think for a moment, because uh, if, uh, if someone has tuberculosis in, in, uh, in a family, with multi-drug resistance um, and you call the family and you find someone that is tuberculin positive or IGRA positive and you decide to treat, you really do not know what you are treating because this person could be positive because he was positive you know, two years ago due to some other exposure 10 years ago. So you end up using potentially uh, uh, toxic drugs for a number of months which is not well defined, right? Because we don't know really. Uh, for something that is not uh, deserving to be treated. So it's, it's a difficult choice. And uh, uh, some people, as I say, use observation, saying, I observe what is going on. Some others try with fluoroquinolones or things like that. But uh, uh, we are, in fact, uh, this is one area of research on which we need uh, clarity. Okay. Uh, Mario, you have been on the board of TB Alliance uh, also. And the rollout of child-friendly TB, the fixed dose combination TB medicines, has been a big success relatively. Uh, I believe over more than 1 million doses have been shipped to 93 countries in just three years. And if we compare this to other rollouts of new technologies and medicines, this is usually better. What did we do right and better in the rollout of child-friendly fixed dose combination TB medicines? Any lessons learned? Oh. Or better rollout of well, others. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, there was, uh, I think, an information campaign that was really widespread. Um, when when the evidence uh, uh, came out, uh, the evidence, the the, drug, the the combination came out, and uh, it was known that this would be uh, highly effective, like it was with the separate drugs, and even more effective because you're taking one pill, which has now the nice taste, a uh, nice flavor. So for children, it's much more attractive to take than to reject it. Um, then the campaign was so uh, well conducted, uh, especially with national TV programs, uh, to uh, adopt it as quickly as possible. I, I remember talking to one or two governments immediately after this uh, uh, launch of the uh, FDCs for children uh, was, uh, you know, when the launch was done, I had national program contact me, say, I want these drugs immediately for my, for my uh, uh, little you know, patient that I have in my program. So um, it, it was a matter of good communication, well, obviously of solid evidence behind. So the process was such that these drugs, these medicines were of assured quality. Everyone knew that acquiring them would mean having drugs of quality. And then the campaign that was around it, in a, in a way, in a very uh, visible field, which is that of uh, childhood diseases. So when you speak about children, uh, normally people hear better than when you speak about adult diseases, okay? That is a matter of, uh, it's, 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 it's what it is, because that is children health. And, uh, and so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a combination, in my view, of a job well done, 
of the engagement of various partners. Remember, UNICEF was involved. UNICEF is rarely involved in anything to do with tuberculosis. But when it came to children, they were involved. So just having UNICEF behind, having, you know, apart from the World Health Organization, the TB Alliance, uh, the Global Drug Facility was involved. Uh, you know, uh, the International Union was involved. So there were many partners that, uh, you know, in a way, favored the spreading and the, uh, and the information about this new product. And so that is probably uh, what uh, determined then the immediate uh, reaction by the national programs. Besides, there was no real need for national programs to uh, change their policies. The treatment was the same, it's just that you do it with better type of medication. It's different from uh, a new drug for any disease, adult or children, like the case of bedaculin or telamonid or the new drugs that we have seen. It's different because, number one, uh, they are addressed to a very small fraction of the TB population. So the drug resistant ones, and they are not many. We know now uh, about 180,000 diagnosed in the last year. So 180,000 is, is a small number. Children is a higher number, not mean many millions, but it's already a higher number, and it applies in all settings. So um, I think that this, these, are the, these are the lessons to be learned. You have a product, it's an innocent product, is the same as before, but in fixed dose combination in a much more attractive formulation, and then it's easy then to, to spread and to disseminate. Okay, you spoke about bedaculin and delaminate. Uh, are we going in the right direction in the rollout of these two new drugs with enough safeguards to prevent developing any resistance to them? Because we do not want that to happen. So. Are enough safeguards being taken care of by at the global level? <clears throat> oh, I would say that I don't know exactly how to answer that question, but I would say that there are good programs and there are bad programs. So if you have good programs that are conscious of what they do, although even in good programs you have good practitioners and bad practitioners, okay? So let's, let's put it this way. But generally speaking, if you have a good program that defines the need very well, that defines the guidelines very well, that tells every practitioner in that country that can be somewhat controlled in terms of what they prescribe, right? If the program says you have to use this, this drug in that particular way and people listen, then you have a hope that these drugs are used properly and not misused. The big uh, problem with these two drugs, or the third one now, Pretomony, that also yeah. has yeah. been proved, uh, the big problem would be exactly that one on when to use it and how to use it. Now, uh, bedaculin is basically becoming a universal drug for any type of drug resistance. So the recommendation is such that it's basically the top drug there. We know that it's not as toxic as was predicted 10 years ago, because the actual serious side effects have been, in a way, very well uh, uh, contained. Um, similar to, in a way, the fluoroquinolones. So these two will always be the basis of uh, treatment for multidrug resistant TB. And now we have the next trial, we have BPAL, so bedaculin, pretomony, and linezolid, that promises to uh, cure 90% of people, even with the worst forms of multidrug resistant TB, XDR TB, et cetera, et cetera. So one more reason to really be extremely careful on the use of the drugs and always use these drugs in proper combinations to protect against the possibility of developing resistance. If we develop resistance, this is not the HIV uh, uh, type of situation where, as, as I say, there are 35 drugs, in a way or another, you can, if you lose one, you can use another, right? In the case of tuberculosis, the drugs are so rare that if we manage to lose bedaculin, to lose the nitroimidazole, like pretomony, delamony, we are in serious trouble because it will take another several years before we have completely new compounds. So I think the, 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 um, it's a very important point what you are raising, that is that they have to be used under proper condition with, by people that understand what they are doing, just because of the fact that we cannot afford to lose these drugs. Besides the fact that, of course, you have to save the human life, and so it's in, in the interest of everyone to use the drugs in a proper way, in proper combination. Right. Uh, Mario, you have rightly said that we need uh, more financing and more funding for R&D of new tools 
uh, to fight TB. Uh, at the same time, and uh, that is very important, we recognize how desperately we need new tools. But are we using the existing tools to the best of our ability as of now? Well, you know, again, uh, it's very difficult to generalize because there are good programs and bad programs, good practitioners and bad practitioners. The bad practitioners are those who are not helping patients to be, you know, to be cured, and there are those who uh, help infect the development of drug resistance. So uh, um, it's an issue really of the seriousness of a program to, uh, uh, in a way, having guidelines that are clear and that not just clear because they are written well, but clear also because they get down to the periphery, to those who treat people in the end in, 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 in the front, on the front line there, and they use them properly when it comes to drugs. So I think regimens are fairly clear in the world of tuberculosis. For TB, there is no doubt what the regimen is for drug susceptible TB. For drug resistant TB, the guidelines are clear, whether they get down clearly also to those who actually treat patients, that's a question of a good program or a bad program, because the training is important. This, the the, the, the um, uh, collaboration with the peripheral doctors is important, and so on and so forth. When it comes to diagnostics, uh, well, you know, GeneXpert now is being used uh, uh, more and more, and uh, we know that. We see that there is more testing for rifampicin resistance, which is also expression of uh, use of gene expert. I was recently in Esvatini two months ago, and uh, my surprise in a very peripheral clinic in the bush, that is the one where uh, I was in a clinic uh, um, in, a, in the bush, literally, where the road just ends. And then from there on, people are uh, placed in a rural area, so for kilometers and kilometers, and there is a nice clinic there, and they, much pride we are telling me we have gene expert here. So I went to see the machine is there, they are testing patients with TB uh, over there in, with that machine in the real bush of Esvatini. So it means that it's reaching those uh, places where it is needed. Okay, that was a little hospital that takes care of rural populations. Um, and, and you know, gene expert is everywhere in the cities or uh, more and more in countries like South Africa or so on is, is widespread. So that is the best tool we have nowadays for the di rapid diagnosis of uh, tuberculosis and of drug resistance. Um, are we using it well? I, I think there are little doubts about uh, the use of this uh, diagnostic in the sense that if you not use it well, then it's a serious problem because, I mean, it's so easy uh, to use in a way compared to the previous uh, uh, type of test that we had available. Um, so, I mean, you know, uh, the, the issue is once again that of the uh, efficiency and the efficacy of a program and of, uh, uh, um, and of an entire health system to provide at primary care the basis for the use of these tools properly and the basis for early diagnosis and early treatment. That is the way to go. There is no other simple way. So it really depends very much on uh, the program, on the location, on the health system in general. Uh, I remember, Mario, you had said that it is a clinical malpractice uh, not to do uh, upfront universal DST, and rightly so. You had said it uh, <laughs> a few years ago. Uh, but even now, despite uh, having the gene expert, uh, what the Global TB report shows that I think it's less than 60% cases uh, were by bacteriologically confirmed uh, diagnosis of TB. Less than yeah, so. It, it, yeah, well, uh, the, 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 the statement remains that is that it is malpractice not to do drug susceptibility testing in a patient with tuberculosis. That is the remnant of the past when there was no easy test. You know, if a, a culture, the culture would take three months to get back. The person was already dead, unfortunately. That is what was happening. Nowadays, there is no excuse. Genetics is something that, uh, and in fact, uh, I'm, I'm uh, in a way, um, Sometimes I feel uncomfortable because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a product uh, under monopoly in a way. So it's like advertising for a, for a company. But behind, beyond sorry, that type of consideration is the only real test we have for rapid diagnosis of tuberculosis. So um, I think that is a truly, mal, a truly malpractice not to do it in every single patient. I mean, if I had tuberculosis, the first question I would answer is that, can you please check my resistance status. I want to know if the bacilli are resistant or not because then the treatment is different. 
And if I want to survive, I have to get the best treatment, otherwise I die. So it's, it's, uh, it's really an issue of malpractice in, in my view. And the fact that it's not yet widespread, we have to ask ourselves what the reasons are. Uh, you know, we uh, as WHO at the time, I think it was December of 2010, when we had the final meeting for the um, announcement in a way of the, of the policy that every country should adopt the, uh, the machine, should adopt expert. Uh, it, now we are nine years after and it still is not universally used. So that is a big issue. It's a big issue of the, let's call it the transfer of technology or the transfer of tools that uh, takes too long to uh, really be effective. And the, the real question for those who uh, work on health system in general is why does it take so many years to get down once you have a test like this one that after all is relatively, relatively cheap and is easy to do and it is a, a really sure test uh, that gives you an answer quite uh, uh, strong in a way uh, why it takes such a long time to be adopted. And then the answers are multiple. So you cannot generalize. If you look into uh, some of the answers, I know of big countries that had 900 expert machines bought by the Global Fund sitting in the corridors. Probably they're still sitting there. I know some other countries that had an interest in not approving the introduction of expert because they were trying to develop their own variant, thinking that they would uh, 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 save money or they would able to start some companies that are producing uh, locally uh, adapted uh, you know, uh, uh, machines, which never proved to be effective in the end. But that meant losing, uh, not months, years, for implementation of something that is in fact the uh, best that we have nowadays. So uh, reasons are multiple. It's not just uh, what we say is neglect, you know, people forget about TB. No, there are sometimes very precise interest in not adopting certain technology that come from, from the outside. And this is the concerning part because politics come in now and economics can come in. And, uh, and that is where the scandal really is. Uh, Mario, with just a week, less than a week left for the 50th Union World Conference on Lung Health, uh, which will be held in India. Can you share uh, your thoughts about some out-of-the-box approaches to help reimagine this whole TB care and control? We are failing somewhere down the line. So any suggestions from your, any key insights from your side to help guide thinking? Uh, I'm not sure we are failing or, you know, because, uh, because we have seen also a lot of progress. That has to yes. be recognized. Yes. 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 Uh, so, if you, for instance, the fact that, uh, let me mention one, you know, I think the most uh, important finding of this report is that there are now 7 million people of this global TB report that have been notified. Um, so that was after years of stagnation around 6 million, 6.2, 6.3, 6.4. Um, what was that determined that? Was India and Indonesia, for example, having taken more and more seriously the problem of the private sector? So having essentially engaged the private sector in such a way that these cases are notified. And the next step, not just the notification for the statistic, but is actually uh, the uh, possibility once you engage the private sector to ensure that they are using diagnostics and drugs in a proper way. So that is what it should be. So this is progress, right? So we have to recognize that kind of, of progress. Now, what is needed in the TB community? If you ask me, there are essentially, again, uh, uh, there are several levels of impediment. The obvious one is that the tools are not perfect. And that's why everyone's struggling to try to get a point of care test for disease and for infection, better regimen, shorter regimens. We have now a shorter regimen for XDR TB, by the way, approved two months ago. So uh, uh, the, the most important thing now would be that programs, understanding that is available rather than having to go for 24 months, making people suffer, etc. let's adopt this one. I mean, it's not, unfortunately, without side effects, but it's a major advance. You get side effects as you were before, probably, but you get it in six months and hopefully you are 90% cured. So that's progress, right? So we have to recognize that. So we have this kind of advances uh, so we, we have, once again, going to the challenges, we have uh, now issues related to the tools that are not perfect, as I said, 
uh, they're becoming better and better, but they're not perfect. We don't still have a vaccine, right, that is effective. There is a promising one. Let us see. Uh, so we have a problem with tools, but the two major, in my way, hurdles are at the level of political commitment and of financing. So political commitment means that, uh, as we were saying at the beginning, even with the UN General Assembly, we have not gotten to the level that people were hoping for. And that is, that is the issue. Uh, and, and the second one, which is direct consequence of this one, of the political commitment, is that of financing. Financing is not increasing at the pace that it should be. Uh, and you see that if you look at the global plan, the 11 billion that I trust is okay. This one, I'm not in agreement with the, with the 2 billion for research. I think it should be 10 times more. But uh, for the one in implementation, I think that thinking about 10, whatever it is, 10, 11 billion per year is more or less right. And we are now three or so billion less than that uh, particular target. And so unless countries invest, and once again, countries should invest more and more of their own domestic resources. Let us remember TB is largely a disease of the middle income countries, the BRICS. So if these BRICS do not invest their money into the fight against tuberculosis, they cannot wait or expect that the global fund will cover you know, the, the, the majority of cases of TB. So there is a really a need of internal commitment, domestic commitment, and domestic resources. And this is, in a way, what is, in my view, really blocking us from an acceleration of the activities. It's only through, in the end, good health system that detect cases early, that treat cases as quickly as possible, that cure people, that block transmission, that uh, you know, TB can be won. And unless we have this commitment, including, by the way, the prophylaxis part that uh, you know, we were discussing at length. Yeah. So uh, if we don't have this commitment, if we do not, do not have the investment of money, if we do not invest in research, you know, if you look at the number one donor for research nowadays, that is NIH, they invest uh, 250, I believe, million dollars per year, which is huge. As a contributor, that's major. NIH is the number one contributor in the world. Nevertheless, when you look at how much they invest on HIV, it's 10 times more. So that is where, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say. So it's really a need of major investment, of major commitment that will make the fight accelerate. Otherwise, you know, we have to adopt the status quo type of philosophy, and the status quo goes like this. When you're lucky, in one year you find half a million cases more, because India and Indonesia have done the right thing. But, you know, it stays there and it will, you know, slowly increase, but never accelerate to the point that we need to reach the uh, global targets. Uh, many thanks, Mario. Friends, you were listening to Dr. Mario Reviglion, a renowned global health expert who has helped shape efforts to NTB. And he was with us in this new episode of NTB Dialogues, a special CNS series presenting insightful and thought-provoking interviews with leaders like Mario to accelerate progress towards ending TB. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mario. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.